This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. It's an American epidemic. Digestive problems lead to food sensitivities, which can lead to life-threatening diseases like colon cancer. But is modern bread to blame? And could bread made the way Yehovah intended be the answer? By special request from Michael Rood himself, Sue Becker joins us tonight to explain how bread can be a lifesaver. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Tonight, we talk about something almost everyone can identify with, food sensitivities. And there is a biblical connection. That's why Michael Rood wanted Sue Becker to be our guest for this special series called Against the Grain. Episode three is tonight, coming up in just a few minutes. But first, it's time for the calendar with the longest name in the history of humanity, mm -hmm. the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. We are on the second Shabbat of the fourth month there. You have it on your screen, and you can see this page online for free at arudawakening.tv slash calendar page. Now, please welcome my co-hosts, plural, David Robinson and the one and only Michael Rood. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, Scott. You know, one of the most important things in the Bible are the, the Gospels, uh, the words of the prophet, we must hear and obey, we must shema. And okay. you spent a lot of time writing the chronological Gospels, and now I understand it is in Russian. A digital version yes. in Russian. Yes, we have a lot of good help out there. And we're very thankful to all the people who are helping us get this in other languages, like Pamela Lutzker and many people are doing this, so the Russian people will have this at last. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, and, 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 you know, we need it in Russian right now. So, yeah, we, yeah do. we really do. We really so do. in addition to Pam Lutzker, we want to mention a couple other folks who put a lot of effort into this. That's Elena Sauber and Tolly Eckert. Oh, so yeah. those three. Elena and Tolly, they yeah. are really good. Yep. Yeah. So they have put that together, and you can get it. Uh, there's the information at the bottom of the screen where you can get it. Uh, it's at arudawakening.tv uh, slash Russian. Quite simple, as simple as that. And you can get the digital version of the Chronological Gospels in Russian. How about that? All right, so the name of our calendar, we were talking about the calendar here, is the Astronomically and Agriculturally Corrected. It, it has a connection with the, with the land in Israel, with the harvest. Uh, we need to get back to the land, et cetera, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So the world's elite who think they you know, are God these days, folks like Bill Gates and such, well, they're, you know, they're buying up all the land. We know this. They're, they're buying up all the farmland in America and other places. So what does this tell us? Uh, work our own land to do the opposite of what they do. So check out our blog section. Uh, go to the blog section there. You go to the menu, community, and blog, and you'll see one really good uh, blog that was put up there recently by Svi Ben Daniel, uh, who's on our Spanish team, and it's called How to Escape the System of the Beast. And it really talks about this, how to uh, get away from whatever whatever is coming against us, we need to be doing the opposite. So if, if the people of the world that we don't necessarily like so much are buying up all the land, we need to do that and take care of ourselves with our own land because there's mm -hmm. something sinister there that's happening. We want to separate ourselves from that. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, in, in the way things are going now in the world today, we need to be more self-sufficient, which too. our self-sufficient sufficiencies should uh, branch out into a community type setting yes. where we're helping each other bringing our gifts and doing that. Mm -hmm. And with the, all the processed food today, what are we eating now, 60% of the food we eat is processed? <laughs> right. You know, this Sue Becker stuff's really good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was very pleased to see uh, David on Shabbat Night Live and he was doing uh, the, the survival training, mm -hmm. and 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 it was very good. But I said, I don't want to know what to do <laughs> to leave the house. That's right. I don't want to, I don't do want to live, live in a tent. <laughs> no, no, I don't and, either. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I have at my house, I have a grain mill, and I have the food that I need to survive. 
without having to shoot a uh, doe. And you've got me to do that for you, so you don't have to worry. And that's what yeah. community's all about, community right? About. <laughs> I bring over the venison. So then and yeah. we don't have a grain grinder, we can go to Michael's house. There you go. Grind the grain yeah, grinder. Yeah, you can make my bread, I'll make your good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got that, and then one of my neighbors told me about Sue Becker. Oh, okay. And, and I said, I don't know anything about her. And I watched her on, on YouTube, mm -hmm. and it, she was so good that I said, we have to have her. Yep. We have to have her in the office to teach everyone. And you know. And, and that's. That's what we're going to have now. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. a great idea. Yes. You know, just to have her come here and teach us some of the stuff. That she yes, she's actually, she's going to teach us, uh, well, we'll save that for, yeah. the, for, we'll save yeah. that for the episode tonight. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, she's wonderful. And she actually got me thinking about bread because, you know, I'm, I've been gluten-free for a long time. Uh, but she said that people do what I'm doing because of the way the bread is being made, not necessarily right. because of the bread itself. Right. And that's a real mind shift where everybody thinks that, you know, we throw out the baby with the bathwater. Oh, gluten's causing this issue. All bread is bad. Get rid of it all. Where, well, wait a second. You know, how come it was good in the Bible? What have we done to it? That's the thing. It was good up to probably around the 20s when they started commercially Right, uh, uh, making flour. Right, and so that, that's where we get into issues, and I'm so glad, Michael, that you had us bring her in because yeah, she's really she's got me thinking with, more with an open mind about where, you know, yeah. we, not, we don't need to be yeah, throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater. The bread of life is not a bad thing. Yeah, that's, that's right. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, absolutely. It's a good thing. Yeah. It's a bread of life, not death. That's absolutely, right. yes. That's right. So when the rest of the world is throwing out bread and the bread of life, by the way, Yeshua, we mm -hmm. should be embracing both. There you go. <laughs> now, uh, David, we need to talk about the love gift yes, that we have absolutely. this month. So we have a uh, new love gift this month. Uh, it's only a week old. It's called Revisiting John 316. This is with Joe Kovac. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about an interesting phenomenon when you're reading the Bible in context about John 3.16. It doesn't change the meaning, but it really changes how you see Yehovah viewing our world. Oh, uh, it's just interesting. I'll leave it at that because yeah. I want to let you know Joe do the teaching on that. But for a gift of fifty dollars or more, uh, Michael, I know you like to support. Uh, you like to uh, give something back. That is to people who are supporting us. Yeah. And you always said, yeah, "I want to give them a teaching. If they donate fifty dollars, let's give them this." And that's what this is all about. So with a, a gift of fifty dollars or more, you get this. If you'd like to donate more, we'll give you the teaching and something David has in his hand. Yes, there. we have this beautiful. Um uh, sterling silver coated yes. uh, Shema necklace. So you have the Hebrew here, uh, which is uh, Deuteronomy 6 4. Mm -hmm. the, uh, Yeshua said it was the greatest commandment. So a gift of $100, yeah. you get the teaching and you get this beautiful necklace. And a gift of $300 or more, you get this beautiful, and let me show you this. That's too big to unfold. This is a hollow bread cover. You not only get a hollow bread cover, but you also get a, this beautiful tablecloth that measures 60 by 108. That's huge. Yeah, yeah, and you can use this for any feast day, but um, you know, you can see that it has the Kiddush cup on it, and it has the seven branch menorah, and says in Hebrew, Hag Sameach, and Shabbat Shalom. So, All right. There you go. And we Wonderful love gifts. Deeply appreciate all of you who give. And uh, this is just Michael's way of giving you a little something back and showing you our appreciation. Absolutely. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Michael. All right, so it's an American epidemic. Digestive problems lead to food sensitivities, lead to life-threatening diseases like colon cancer. Is bread to blame? By special request from Michael Rood, Against the Grain with Sue Becker is on the way. But first, it's time for the Kiddush with Michael, next. John 3.16 is arguably the most famous verse in the Bible, but are we misinterpreting it? Joe Kovacs presents a thought-provoking teaching that re-examines what the verse really means, how we should understand it, and why a proper interpretation of it is vital to understanding Yehovah's view of the world and the sacrifice of His Son. He can't be telling us, don't love the world and the things of the world, and also saying that, well, God loves the world so much. They, they're just completely contradictory. And the key to understanding this verse is the very simple short word, so. Revisiting John 3.16 with Joe Kovacs will challenge your assumptions about the true message of Yehovah's Word. And it's our gift to you for supporting A Root Awakening International. Donate a $50 love gift and we'll send you Revisiting John 316 with Joe Kovacs on DVD or Blu-ray. Or donate $100 and we'll send you Revisiting John 316 
plus a beautiful silver-plated pendant necklace featuring the Shema in Hebrew letters. Or donate $300 and we'll send you the teaching, the silver-plated Shema necklace, plus this dazzling Shabbat tablecloth and matching holobread cover inlaid with artwork from the menorah, the Kiddush cup, and the words Shabbat Shalom in Hebrew. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Root to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. These special gift collections are available only in July and supplies are limited. So make your donation today and receive these exclusive thank you gifts from Michael Rood. Call 888-766-3610. That's 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online at monthlylovegift.com. The Chronological Gospels Bible is changing lives all over the world, putting everything the Messiah did in exact chronological order and explaining the behind the scenes truth of what the Messiah did, when he did it, and why. The timing of it all means everything. And now, the Chronological Gospels can be easier on your eyes. The larger print edition features 40% larger type and every page appears exactly the same as the original, so you can follow along with others who have the regular size version. The Chronological Gospels Larger Print Edition also has wider margins to write notes, and the premium quality paper means you can highlight without soaking through. Plus, the Larger Print Edition lies flat, so you can teach without having to hold the book open. The Chronological Gospels Larger Print Edition is a big and beautiful coffee table book, measuring a full 12 inches tall and 9 inches wide. Study the Bible with clarity and ease. I love the size of this book. This is 9 by 12. The paper is, is perfect because it doesn't bleed through when I write on it. I can mark it up, and I always make notes in all my Bibles. Everything is the same place as it is on the smaller version, and I can just stand back and I can teach from it, and it's just, it's the perfect size. I pray thee, of whom speaks this prophet? Order the Chronological Gospels Larger Print Edition by phone or online. You'll get 40% larger type than the original. Call 800-788-7887. That's 800-788-7887 or get the Chronological Gospels Bible Larger Print Edition online at arudawakening.tv slash large. Some of the traditions in modern-day Judaism are what Yeshua said are takanot, laws which change biblical law, which are forbidden, and Yeshua said don't do them. But other traditions are remembrances of good things in the past, and they are a shadow picture of good things to happen in the future. On the Sabbath, we take two hollow loaves, two loaves of bread. This represents the manna, the double portion that we received on the sixth day. This was God's provision for us. And this is what it continues to mean to us today. When Yeshua just before his crucifixion, the night before his crucifixion, at the last supper that he had with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed, not the bread, he blessed the Most High. And he said, Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech ha'olam hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. And he broke the bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, remember this, by his stripes, we were healed. And then he took the cup and he said, in the prayer of Melchizedek to Abraham, Baruch atah Yahuvah, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Borei puri hagafen. Blessed are you, Yahuvah, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said this, what you have been doing for a thousand years from the time of Abraham, this represents the renewed covenant in my blood. This is how I will pay for the broken covenant. I will pay the death penalty and do this until I come.
So how did we get here? How did we get to the idea that wheat is one of the most toxic things you can put in your mouth? I mean, I believe that. That's why I became gluten-free. But is that the right way to go? Am I just avoiding something because I don't know what the real answer is? Let's get some information from Sue Becker of the Bread Beckers. Welcome back, Sue. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's not the most toxic thing no, you can I put mean, in the body. No, where do we get this idea? I mean, we see wheat all over the Bible. How can it be that bad? And yet now gluten is a affecting everyone. I mean, where have we gone wrong here? Well, we've gone wrong with, in 1910, we let someone take our upper millstone and yep. we've been getting sick ever since. We talked about that, So yeah. wheat is not a problem. I think we mentioned already, wheat is not genetically modified. It has been crossbred by traditional breeding methods. It is what is done to the flour. Mm. And I absolutely agree. Everybody that says, oh, gluten causes this, gluten causes this, gluten causes this. It's not the gluten, it's the processed flour. Mm. So, um, you know, that's that's what is making people sick. Now, you had educated me about what gluten yeah. is. It's not something that's inherently in a grain. Like they say, right. gluten-free oats right. and gluten-free this. Yeah. But that's important for people to understand. Teach us all, please. Yeah. So here's the deal. So wheat, since the beginning of time, the wheat family has a specific genetic makeup in their genes of a specific sequence of proteins, okay? Wheat is a unique family of grains in that when you mill that wheat into flour and you hydrate that flour, you wet it, it forms this stretchy substance, I say a culinary term, that they've called gluten, it's elastic, so it's okay? Gooey. Yeah, it's, yeah, it stretches. That is important for yeast spreads, all right? Or whether it be sourdough or our commercial yeast today. When, ye when yeast feeds on the wheat and the carbohydrates and the sugars in that, a byproduct of that feeding process is carbon dioxide gas. It is important to have these stretchy strings, strands of gluten, if you will, so that it traps that carbon dioxide gas and enables the bread to rise. Mm. Since the beginning of time, wheat has been used to make yeasted breads. Why? Because since the beginning of time, it has these proteins that form this stretchy substance. You don't make, well, until recently, till the gluten-free craze, you don't make yeast breads out of rice or corn or buckwheat or millet because they don't have these proteins that form this stretchy substance. So gluten is not something that is in wheat. Gluten, gluten is something that forms from the proteins mm. in wheat getting hydrated. So to say you have a problem with gluten, then you perhaps have a problem with the protein digestion. Now, a true celiac, and when I say a true celiac, celiac disease is genetic. You're born with it. You're typically diagnosed with it by the time you're seven, 10 years old. You're, when I was growing up, you were probably been the sickly child because people didn't know as much then. If you, and the, the component in the wheat protein that a celiac cannot the digest is something called gliadin. And that is one of the amino acids that makes the stretch, glutenin and gliadin. Hmm. That's what makes the stretch of gluten. Okay. So a true celiac can't break that down. They will never be able to eat wheat, whether it's milled fresh or not. Okay. And when you can't digest those proteins, like for a celiac, it's going to lay down the villi in your digestive system. It's going to compromise your other di um, absorption of other minerals and your whole digestive process. That's why oftentimes a celiac is sickly. They have stomach cramp, mm -hmm. you know, abdominal cramps or actually colon cramps. Um, they're anemic. You know, they can't gain weight because they can't absorb nutrients and anything with gluten in it gives them really bad bowel issues. Now, the problem is today is I think it, I recently read a percentage is about 60% of people that decide to go gluten-free are self-diagnosed. They know that the bread they're eating in the store gives them stomach cramps, makes them sick, makes, I mean, I've had people say, gives me headaches, makes me throw up, you know. So these are all legitimate concerns but the problem is most of them are not true celiacs or even gluten 
which what did we say? Or, yeah, what did we say gluten is? It's really yeah. these proteins. Now, like I said, a true celiac never ever can will they be able to eat wheat because they simply cannot. But we were never intended to eat the endosperm, the protein and starch of wheat, without the other nutrients, the vitamins, minerals, the enzymes, the phytochemicals, all the phytonutrients all these things that help us metabolize and break that down. So, mm. you know, in my lectures of, of real bread, I go through the whole thing and show you why white bread has caused constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, you know, spastic call, all these things that everybody's now saying it's the gluten that's causing it. No, it's the processed white mm. flour. And I can't tell you how many people are actually set free, like I hope you are going to be, <laughs> set free when they think they have to go gluten-free, and yet they start milling their grain and they find they don't have a problem with it at all. One of my favorite yeah. stories, if we have time for a story, was um, when we did have our bakery, our son owned a bakery and he made you know bread just the way I do from freshly milled flour, made the bread. When the gluten-free craze came about, he did start making a gluten-free bread. He sold his bread at farmer's markets, which, by the way, our bakery does not exist. Everybody wants to buy bread, but it doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. We couldn't, we couldn't survive the uh. gluten-free thing. But anyway, so he sold his bread at farmer's markets. A mom of a young girl came up to him, and she goes, my daughter just hates the gluten-free bread. She just wants sandwiches, and, but if she eats anything with gluten in it, it causes her to have stomach ache. And um, my son explained, well, is she celiac? No, she's not. We've had her tested. No, she's not. And the mom said, you know what, I'm going to just try it. You know, he explained the difference in milling and making the bread from all the components. And um, it was so exciting. I just love it. She, she, so she took the bread home. The little girl came back the next week. My son's name was Dave, and she called him Mr. Dave. And she came <laughs> running up, Mr. Dave. She could hardly, you know, go reach over the table. Mr. Dave, Mr. Dave, I just love your bread. I ate a sandwich every day with it, and I had no stomach ache. And that was what the mom said. She would just be in such a, you mm. know, have such abdominal pain, maybe even throw up or whatever. And yet she ate this bread from freshly milled flour and no problems at all. Wow. And we saw that over and over as we tried to educate people about what gluten really is and that there is no genetically modified wheat. It's not the wheat that is the problem. It's the processing. Um, you know, we've been eating this now for a hundred and something years. Right. You know, my grandparents grew up on freshly milled flour. They didn't see the diseases that my parents no. and now we're seeing and now our children. Right. Ugh. Now, that, here's something that I've heard and mm -hmm. I have espoused in my yeah. teachings to people was that over the years, the hybridization of wheat, which is what you're talking about, the natural uh -huh. natural hybridization, not GMO, genetically modifi modification is, is something a whole different. Other evil. And uh, to that point, I mean, let's go there first. There were some trials in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Didn't work out. There wasn't much acceptance on the part of the farmers, and they just let it die. Right. So there is no genetically modified wheat, right. to your point. Exactly. So the hybridization of wheat, I used to tell people, and still do, and, and I hope you can help me explain this. Um, there's been so much hybridization that there's, what's happened is an accidental cause of an overproduction of gluten in certain varieties of wheat. Is that false? That, from everything that I have studied and read, and I spent a good couple of years just digging and digging and into this whole wheat belly, anti-grain, yeah. gluten, you know. And from what I've read, there was um, actually um, a, a professor that, or I don't know if he was a geneticist, I don't remember, but he went back to the seed banks and studied the different strains of wheat from as far back as 100 years. And he is finding no significant difference mm. in the proteins that form gluten in 100 years of seeds. So this is a myth. This, so. this is a myth. Also, what a lot of people don't realize, the genetics is there for those proteins, but what determines the protein content in, in a grain more than anything is rainfall during the heart, during the growing season. Ah. If you get a lot of rainfall, you're going to get a very low protein content and a very high moisture content. You know, here in the southeastern United States, we can't grow hard wheat. I mean, we can plant it, but it won't have the protein content to really make a good yeast bread. I think we talked right. about that earlier. Of We grow a pastry flour here. 
why is the South? Every grandma in the southeastern United States is known for biscuits, cakes, you know, pies. That's because that's the the pastry flour is a soft wheat. Mm. So that's what's grown here. So that's a misnomer. Um, Yes, I mean, they've they've bred the wheat to have a, you know, different nutritional profile. But the other thing you hear is everybody, yeah, but what about this Japanese dwarf wheat? Well, they bred over years wheat with wheat to get a higher protein, maybe, or not really even that, get a higher yield. That's what it is. wasn't so much the higher protein in low um, fertile countries, poor growing conditions, poor soil conditions mm-hmm. to try to get a, a grain and a crop that would, that would produce more. So right. not necessarily, like I said, the protein, it was more the yield. I misspoke there. So they developed this wheat, they had it, and then they decided to cross it with a dwarf wheat because they wanted more of the nutrients from the soil, what few they could get, to go to producing the wheat instead of a big, tall mm-hmm. plant. I mean, we all know, if you if you garden at all, you know, if you over-fertilize your, your plant, you're going to get a big, nice, bushy bush, but not a lot of... Right. So you want those nutrients to go to producing the wheat instead of the Mm. big plant. So that was where that came from. And it's interesting to note that everybody, you know, says that, oh, you know, America and this every the wheat's changed. This wheat variety was adopted worldwide in like 1960. Mm. So if if that was a, a huge problem. Why is America seeing this problem and not other countries? Speaking of American know? problems, so let's, yeah. so the, I think you have a verse about Haggai. Uh, yes. One. So read us what Haggai says. Yeah. So Haggai chapter one. I'm going to kind of ad lib it a little bit here. So verses five and six, um, one of my favorite scriptures says, you know, you clothe your you you plant, but you harvest little. You drink, but you don't get enough. You clothe yourselves, but no one is is warm. And it says, and then you, you work to, how how did I say it? Uh, Basically you you put your earnings in a sack sack with with holes in it. You you work to earn your earnings to put it in a sack with holes in it. And when I saw that, I, I was like, wow, this is, this is really amazing to me. The bread situation and the food situation, that's a perfect description. Over here, we're working to earn wages. I I had a little, (laughs) we earn wages (laughs) to put it in a bag with holes in it. So we're working, working to earn money. We spend it on stuff in the store that I can't really call food. If you shop the aisles of the grocery store, that's where you get into trouble. That's why they call them foodstuffs. Yeah. (laughs) Literally. Yes, that's that's right. Stay on the perimeter. That's where the real fruits and vegetables, (laughs) meat, eggs, cheese, you know, and if you notice, there's no nutrition labels on those things. They don't have to be there. You know what you're getting. Whereas here, you gotta you gotta know all this. So you were earning wages, we're buying stuff, we're spending our money, our hard-earned wages on stuff that is making us sick. Hmm. And so to me, that is putting it in a bag with holes in it because then we spend the rest of our earnings on medical bills, medicine, or if we try to go help, then on supplements and all of this stuff, trying to fix the things that that stuff out there in the store actually caused. You know, I was reading one day in in Matthew, you know, the scripture where it says, you know, don't worry about what you're going to eat because, you know, God will provide, he closed the the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap, yet they have. And I was like, gosh, is that what I'm doing by reading nutrition labels or, you Mm. know, thinking about what I'm eating? And God just so spoke to me. He was like, no, because here's who's worrying about their, what they're eating. How many fat grams, how many carbohydrates, is this going to shoot my blood sugar up? When you're having to worry, is this too much salt? Is it not real food? You don't have to worry about that. Right. Real food has the exact proportions of sodium and potassium that you need. Processed foods, just the opposite. You know, so that's what God showed me is when we have to worry about, is this too much fat? Is it too much sodium? Is it too much sugar? Is it not da 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 da? And that's from processed foods. Hmm. Now, people have found themselves in a bind now. Yeah. Where I mean, most people have found themselves in a bind, even myself, who's, yeah. who feels I have to go gluten-free because I've got yeah. issues if I 
touch gluten, for example. Yeah. Well, now I know the right way to go, and I'm going to try that. Yes, yes, yes. But, and I, I and hope so you do many, too. so <laughs> many people. I mean, I could just go on and on and on with stories of yeah, people. Yeah. Well, that, let's talk about that. So, so some people find themselves in this situation. Yeah, so, yeah. for example, constipation. Yep. You've mentioned before in other episodes that America is the most constipated country in the world. Yes. How do we get here, and how do we work our way back? I out know. Of this? That's what we've got to got to look at is. How did we get here and how do we go back? Here's how we got here. 1900, mm -hmm. steel rolling mills came on the scene, yep. separated the bran and germ, left us with white flour. The bran and germ is where all the fiber is. We talked a good bit about nutrients and vitamins and minerals and And, and that, feeding into cows and, and pigs. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, and, that, and why they're healthy and we're not. And, um, and that's important, but there's an important nutrient missing from our diet, and that's mm. fiber. And people are being told every day, get more fiber, get more fiber. You know, I talked to one lady, she had hemorrhoid surgery and polyps and had surgery, and the doctor sent her home and said, whatever you do, don't get constipated. Well, she obviously didn't know how to not get constipated. And this is, this is a problem. People are being told to get more fiber. They don't even know what fiber is and what fiber does. Mm -hmm. Fiber is technically, it's an undigestible carbohydrate. It cannot be broken down by your body's own enzymes and digestive system. Um, there's two types of fiber. There's soluble fiber and there's insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber we get mostly from beans, um, fruits and vegetables, grains as well. But insoluble fiber comes mostly from that bran mm -hmm. and the germ fiber of grains. And though they both do um, have specific jobs, but insoluble fiber is perhaps the most mm -hmm. critical. You know, when we digest our food, we eat our food, we chew our food, it's important to chew your food. Carbohydrate digestion starts in your mouth. Your saliva has an enzyme called amylase, mixes it with your food, goes ahead and starts digesting those carbohydrates. I just want to stop right here. To me, that's an incredible indication that we were made to digest carbohydrates. When God starts the process right in your mouth and he put that amylase in your saliva. Right. So it's just so powerful there because we're being told, oh, we weren't designed, you know. And yet you should have not. Through, it, yeah. He went through the field and picked, yeah, and the, picked the grain it and, and, ate, and, and it. ate it. And, so yeah. that's an so. incredible indication there. So we swallow what we chewed down. It gets to our stomach. Now here's where key digestion goes on. Protein digestion. For all practical purposes, your carbohydrate digestion stops. Your protein digestion begins. Why? Because protein digestive enzymes require a very acidic environment to work. So we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Our stomach has um, cells in our stomach lining that start producing acid. Bring it down, I believe, to so like a pH of three, two to three. Um, this could eat a hole in this table, <laughs> probably, you know, but we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We have cells in our stomach lining that create mucus to protect, to protect our stomach from this very acidic environment. So protein digestion begins. These enzymes mm. start working. This food is churned. That's why we feel some movement in our stomach as this is churned. And it, and it, I say it purees it <laughs> into something called chyme. And um, this chyme then is taken, once protein digestion is completed there or done its job, is taken over into our small intestines. So it shoots over in there. First thing that begins to happen in that very first part of our small intestines, these um, minerals, um, bicarbonate, start coming into there to alkalize that that liquid chyme again, because we don't want that acidity to be going mm -hmm. through our small intestines. So then this is where our pancreatic enzymes come. Then they're brought to our small intestines, liver enzymes, gallbladder brings bile, all these things to then complete the task of protein, carbohydrate, and fat digestion. Mm. Okay. This is critically important. The bran fiber though can't be broken down. It's an insoluble fiber, can't be digested by these enzymes. So for years, they didn't really think that it had much nutritional value, but it does. So as this chyme passes on through the small intestines, the individual nutrients that are absorbed into our body through from our small intestines, what is left over, the waste, gets dumped into our, I call it our big trash can. Mm -hmm. It's not that big. It's our colon, our large intestine. And so what begins to happen in our large intestine, 
first thing, a lot of people don't know this. We all hear now today, and I've been teaching on this for 30 something years as a food microbiologist, our good gut organisms, you know, the importance of eating fermented foods and those good gut organisms. Everybody's taking probiotics and all that. What a lot of people don't realize is they live predominantly in our large intestine. They're, they're everywhere, but they live predominantly in our large intestine. They begin to feed on the insoluble, undigested grain fiber mm. that's dumped into the colon after it goes through digestion because it can't be broken down, so it's dumped there. They are like a food fermenting factory. In fact, it's called a gut fermentation. There are all kinds of nutrients that are produced by these organisms breaking down that undigested fiber. So they produce B vitamins, which are needed just by every biochemical process that goes on in our body. Even if you ate the most perfect diet, you could not get enough of those B vitamins. Mm. Isn't God good? He put a little factory in there to give us what else we needed, kind of like fruits and vegetables, grains and beans. We get mm -hmm. what we need. So we have that going on. They produce, um, they even produce antibiotics. They don't want the pathogenic organisms living there any more than we do. They produce fatty acids. Um, butyrate or butyric acid is one that's being heavily studied for its anti-carcinogenic um, activity. Hmm. Also, it protects, it's the energy source for the cells that line our large intestine. Hmm. So grains are not inflammatory. They're actually very healing. Wow. Glutamine. Have, do you know about glutamine? Mm -hmm. A lot of people take that to heal their gut. Do you know what the richest source of glutamine is? Oh, maybe gluten. Uh, maybe wheat. <laughs> Glutinous oh, wheat. wheat, yes. <laughs> um, so this is just very, very healing. And mm. many people don't know this. You know, they know fiber is needed to make them go to the bathroom. But how does that work? There's basically three functions of fiber. When fiber gets to your colon undigested, okay, you have your gut fermentation going on, but basically now the colon is going to do what the colon's made to do. We've, we've eaten solid food, we've chewed it up, we've turned it into a puree, we shunted it through our small intestines, and we dumped it into that liquid now, waste, into our colon. The colon now takes that through a series of what's called peristaltic motion, taking this liquid and now turning it into a solid waste that can mm -hmm. be eliminated through our bowels. And all of that is with the help of wheat. How about that? Well, yeah. we're gonna come back, we're gonna talk okay, more. We're gonna this finish, because we, is... we gotta poop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, wow, <laughs> that's a note when you turn you can, red. <laughs> yeah, you can join us for that coming up in just a minute. <laughs> but we wanna thank you for this uh, wonderful information, yeah. and we have uh, you to thank for it, because you made this possible with your donations. Will you donate now to help others see this into the future? Please and thank you, we'll let you do that for a couple minutes. Minutes.
And thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live. During the break, uh, Michael Rood is in the in the uh, audience here today, and uh, he had mentioned something to you, Sue, about a sponge example. He wanted you to bring out your sponge example since we are talking about how the colon works. Yes. Well, we've been talking about fiber yeah. and the three functions of fiber. Fiber is very much like a sponge. It, You've probably seen there's a commercial, a laxative commercial that uses a little sponge and said, our, com you know, our laxative has fiber in it. And I'm like, why take that? Eat some bread. But anyway, <laughs> so three functions of fiber. When it gets to your colon, it increases the bulk of the stool. It softens the stool. And my very favorite, I think my very Southern mother came up with this. It shortens your transit time. <laughs> I just think that's a wonderful way of saying it. How does it do that? Well, we've gone through digestion. We've dumped the waste and mm -hmm. the undigested, insoluble, good fiber into our colon. Grain fiber is the best for this. It's like a sponge. When the colon starts to do its job, peristaltic motion, the colon regulates water coming in and out. So when it brings that water in, because fiber, the sponge, is in there, it's going to absorb that excess water. So in what's going to happen, just like that sponge, when you put a dry, shriveled up sponge down in water, what happens? It absorbs that water, it swells. So fiber, number one function, increases the bulk of the stool, mm. okay? Take that shriveled up sponge, you put it down in water, absorbs the water, it increases the bulk of the stool, but it's also what? Very soft now mm. and pliable instead of being hard and stiff. So number two function of fiber, softens the stool. Number three function of fiber, how does it shorten your transit time? You only have the urge to eliminate when the colon is full. So when fiber is there, it absorbs that water that sponge swells, puts pressure on the walls of the colon, stimulates the colon, peristaltic motion to go like this. I say, that's the urge you get when you say, right. stop the car. Oh, I gotcha. I'll be right back, you know, I gotta go. So we have that urge to eliminate more often because we're eating foods that have fiber mm. in it. And I just can't tell you, fruits and vegetables do great to soften the stool, but grain fibers are very, very mm. critical to get that bulk there. Now you mentioned that the sponge is kind of like those ones you see uh, for cleaning sinks. They're yellow <laughs> on one side and they're green yep. on the other. Yeah, so I have a whole little analogy there. It's, <laughs> it's uh, I say gra grain fiber in particular, bran, is like the green side of the sponge. So every time you eliminate Eliminate, so you, you have this big bulky stool, but yet it's soft, can very easily be eliminated through an orifice this big, but the green side of the sponge scrubs your colon clean every mm. time you go. And really, so, that is a true function. It's, That's what it's it does. It's a true function. One good bowel movement a day is the absolute minimum. If you eat three times a day, you should go eliminate three times a day. Mm. Unfortunately, most Americans, I've talked to some that would go three to five days. Me personally, it might be three to five days before I would go, before, wow. before bread. So how is America living? We're eating food devoid of fiber, white bread, very few fruits and vegetables. A lot of times through a drive through we're not chewing our food, right? <laughs> we're right. gulping it and throwing it back to the back seat to the kids. I, I tell everybody, I said, I think that's why they have this drink now called a big gulp. So you can just gulp and swallow that hunk of food that you just <laughs> bit off. But anyway, so we're already compromising our carbohydrate um, digestion mm -hmm. in our mouth. We're not chewing our food. We swallow our food down. Protein digestion should begin here. Now, we have a problem. Do we know what the one of the number one especially over-the-counter drugs or even prescribed drugs in America, antacids, mm. Prilosec, Nexium. They are even going Tums to, and Rolaids. Yes, and things even like Tums that. and Rolaids. People are eating them, thinking it's going to help, and it might take away the symptoms, but it's not correcting the problem. What it is doing is neutralizing that stomach acid. Now what do we have? Well, we have protein digestive enzymes that need an acid environment to break down proteins. What did we say gluten was again? The proteins in grains that form this stretchy substance, right? So we have a protein digestive enzymes and we're eating white flour stuff that is pure protein and starch for the most part. So no wonder we have a protein digestive 
we have a protein digestion problem. And it doesn't just stop there. Um, allergy, the technical definition of an allergy is an adverse immune response to a protein component typically. So we have all mm -hmm. these issues going on. And I believe a lot of it is digestion. We can't break those down. If we don't break those proteins down, it's gonna cause problems all the way down the digestive line. So now how can bread help us with this? Because I, when we were talking, when we were first planning this episode, yeah. you had told me a whole, it made yeah. all kinds of sense that if yeah. we just add bread, all of these problems kind of go away. So yeah, some a lot Properly of them do. Properly made bread. Right, right. Yeah. Well, we gotta get that stomach acid going and working and those digestive enzymes. So then when our stomach creates that chyme, it's shunted into our small intestines where bicarbonates, <laughs> sodium, calcium, magnesium, which mm -hmm. we're deficient in as well, start alkalizing it so those enzymes can work. But here we have a problem. Our food has been thoroughly pureed. We don't really have fiber. Mm -hmm. And fiber is also a toxin magnet. People oh. don't understand that. Um, uh, where it absorbs the toxins and the trash all the way through digestion, and then it's dumped into our colon. Mm. But without the fiber there, we lose that. But nonetheless, this puree is dumped over into our colon. So our colon starts to do the colon's job. Well, first of all, our good organisms that are supposed to be there feeding on that fiber, they now have no food, mm. right? So we're gonna lose that B, well, nope, we've even done worse. We've killed those good organisms with the heavy use of antibiotics. And don't misunderstand me, there's a time and place for antibiotics, but we have way overused them. What we don't realize is they kill the good along with the bad. So we've greatly dis disrupted that good microflora, microbiome, whatever you want to call it, in our gut. So right there, we lose our gut fermentation factory, all those B vitamins, butyric acid, acid, you know, all these, mm -hmm. uh, vitamin K is another one, the natural antibiotics that could boost our immune system. A lot of people think of immune system as white blood cells and, you know, uh, phagocytes and lymphocytes and all these things. Those good guys are most of our immune system. They mm. catch it before it gets to be a real problem. So we have that going on. So now the colon, though, starts to do its job. Contract, relax, contract, relax, drawing water in, letting water out. There is no fiber there, right, mm. to absorb that excess water. So guess what's going to happen? It's going to let that water out. So now what's going to happen to our waste that's there? It's going to get compacted, and it's not going to absorb. It's not going to increase the bulk. It's not going to be soft. So I, when I lecture, I have this little diagram. So I'm like, we eat lunch today, dinner today, you know, bre breakfast today, lunch today, dinner today, no urge to eliminate because mm -hmm. there's no fiber there, no absorbing the water, no increasing the bulk of the stool. So we eat breakfast tomorrow, lunch tomorrow, dinner tomorrow, and we go on and on and on three, four, five days. Mm -hmm. Well, with no urge to eliminate. So what happens oftentimes is especially when you get to be an adult, you go, this is not right. You usually feel bloated. You've got maybe got a headache because what, what is that? That's waste that should have been taken out. Toxins backing up. Yeah, and, and you decide, <clears throat> I'm going in. I'm going <laughs> in that bathroom and, you know. And it's not soft because there's no fiber there. So it's not easily eliminated. So you push, you strain, you rip, you tear, you get hemorrhoids, you get fissures, you get um, a common problem in America is diverticulitis or diverticulosis. You get these little diverticuli believed to be directly related to the strain of trying to mm. push a hard stool out. You get these little pockets, these little balloons in, blown up in your colon. Now you've got a problem because now you're not eliminating. You've got fecal material sitting in your colon. It backs up in these little openings. Now you've got breeding ground for infection as the colon tries to do its job. So you do eliminate some. No green side of the sponge. Didn't scrub it all. And a lot of times it's not a complete evacuation, you know, complete right. elimination. So the colon, because we're fearfully and wonderfully made, does what the colon does, knows to do. It starts contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, and relax, bringing lots of water in. So now you are getting this feeling that you need to go to the bathroom, that you need to go eliminate, but it is called chronic diarrhea now mm. or 
irritable bowel syndrome, spastic colon. So now instead of going every five days, you now have the urge to eliminate five times a day, maybe 10 times a day if it gets mm. just completely out of hand. Why? Because there's no fiber there. To The colon's just doing its job. It just wants the trash out of there, you know? And now you have this going on all the time. Mm. And people don't make that correlation with what they have going on now, with going five to 10 times a day, with not going mm. but every five days. So have you seen folks on both ends of that spectrum add Yes. We, so the, the yes. properly, I'm going to say here, properly made bread where we take the Real wheat bread. berries, we grind them, immediately make bread, yep. and then eat it. No, I'm not, yes. not getting it from flour or anything. I'm just making yep. the flour and go. Yes. Does that, does that solve both problems? Yes. Isn't God amazing? Yes. I remember in the early days, I mean, you can probably tell I'm pretty, pretty crazy, but you know, we would go do these shows and I would take the bread around the room to the other vendors and people, I'm like, eat this bread and you'll go poop. And this one guy goes, oh, I don't want that. I already go five times a day. That's not my problem. I'm like, you know what? This bread will correct both. Hmm. Only God can make something like that. If you're constipated, only go in every five days or, you know, hard dry stools. The fiber, like the sponge, will absorb that water, soften that stool, increase the bulk of the stool, and help you eliminate normally every mm. day. If, on the other hand, you're going five times a day, that sponge will absorb that extra liquid, you know, extra water that, that the, the colon's bringing in, absorb mm. it, increase the bulk of the stool, you'll start eliminating. And we've seen people completely correct this issue, irritable bowel, spastic colon, mm. In, you know, going five, 10 times a day in just a matter of two weeks. Wow. Now, it'll take a little bit for the colon to, you know, and that green side of the sponge to get <laughs> you all nice and cleaned up and proper, complete, thorough elimination. But to me, only God can create something that looks like two separate issues, but it's really the same digestive issue. So, yeah. And the thing is, that person that's going five times a day thinks they're really clean. You know, but they're not. It's not a thorough elimination. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I have to agree with you. But my parents, just for example, uh, one had one problem, one had the other. Yeah. They both had colon cancer yeah. at age 66. Uh, they were three years apart from each other, but yet 66 years old, then yeah. 66 years old, three years later, same thing, colon yeah. cancer. Now, they both survived it, and we, we taught, some, taught them some things about uh, nutrition. I didn't know about the bread until yes. now. That yeah. would have helped them as well. But yeah. uh, And that's something we need to think about as well, is cancer. Yeah. That's such it's, a huge fear, especially colon cancer. And if we're having all these little problems with our yeah. colon, cancer is the big one to worry about. Yeah. And there's, we talked about B vitamins already. And yeah. there's one B vitamin I wanted you to hit on that maybe not a lot of people have heard of, yeah. except when it comes to, say, apricots. Yeah, yep, yeah. vitamin B17. Um, interesting that you should bring that up. But yes, so colon cancer is a, is a big problem. And just keeping the bowels clean is, is a big, big part of that. And we've seen people, you know, in the years I've, I've studied diverticulitis, Lytus couldn't be, or once those diverticuli were formed, they couldn't be reversed. They were there. Now you could eliminate the symptoms. But we've had several people say they had colonoscopies and they were gone hmm. after doing the bread. Polyps, the same way, yep. which is a lot of time precursor. But I remember years ago in, in my early studies, you know, as people came to me and shared their testimonies, I would dig and I'm like, what is going on? And cancer was one of them. And one researcher, he was a, he was a very prominent biochemist. He did extensive research in why Americans were seeing such a rise in cancer. And you know what? His final conclusion was, is that we were no longer eating the foods that had naturally occurring B17, which the common name for B17 is laetrile, mm. which is a controversial cancer treatment that's been legislated illegal to be used in this country. But the predominant food source of vitamin B17 is seeds. Now, that's what apricot people get from pits, apricot They get it seeds, from apricot yeah. pits, uh, almonds, but grains have it. Grains have B17, millet, wheat, uh, they all should have B17. Because Unless, the grain is, now this is the thing that blew my mind. It's a seed. Yes, and the B17 is, is, does something to protect the integrity of the seed until all the right conditions are met for it to sprout. Have you ever thought about, um, well, I think of acorns. You know, they fall, they fall, they fall but then they don't sprout until 
everything's right. Mm-hmm. You know, they may get rained on and everything, but they don't sprout until everything's right. Same when you plant a seed. It mm-hmm. may take a little bit, but that B17, in, and the reason it, it got a bad rap is it has a cyanide component. And oh, we all know that cyanide is deadly, right? But in small amounts, what this researcher found was that it actually attacked the cancer cells, the abnormal mm. cells, but did not attack our normal cells, which is very different from the way we tend to treat cancer now. So it's so. deadly, but it's deadly to cancer cells, which is yes, wonderful. Yes, and in small amounts, you know? I mean, in the amounts, the way it appears in food. We have a creator that knows what he's doing. Mm. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing to me. That's wonderful. Well, we have many more stories to talk about. We have just a couple of minutes. Yeah. Bring us some information. Well, bring us a teaser. (laughs) Don't tell the whole story. But there's a a story about warts here. Okay. That we'll finish up next week. But uh, give us a little taste of what this is. Well, that's amazing. That was one of the first testimonies that I experienced in the first month. And all we changed was the bread and my son's warts went completely away, and I knew it was the bread. And so I will tell you okay. how I knew it was the bread the next time. All yeah? right, okay. So is so that that's, good? That's very yep. good. All right, thank yep. you. Good You're teaser. Gonna, it's, that's a- <laughs> it's a good one, too. It's a great story. And that's not the only one. There were other folks as well. Yes, uh, a young woman with many, many more warts. Yes, it's one of our number one testimonies. Really? Yep, so I can't wait. And there's, okay. there's a relationship to what we're experiencing today. Okay. All, All right. right. Hang on. To, oh boy. Hang on for this one. All of this because of bread and eating bread properly and making it properly. Can you imagine? Okay. This is so simple. It just might work. So join us next week for <laughs> Shabbat Night Live. We will see you then. Sue Becker will be back here. I'll be back here. Michael will probably be back in the studio here as well. We hope you will join us. We'll see you next week. Until then, Shavua Tov. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.